first presenter will be Steve Kerber. Steve is a researcher at Underwriters Laboratory, and Steve has done a, a, an incredible amount of valuable research in building construction and the performance of fire behavior. And uh, what Steve is going to present today is, is on ventilation and fire behavior. Uh, after Steve, we'll have Jim Tidwell. Jim's a retired deputy chief from Fort Worth, Texas. And also, he was a former vice president of governmental affairs for International Code Council. And then I'll be the caboose. I'll bring it up. Uh, my name is Sean DeCrane. I'm a battalion chief in Cleveland Fire, and I represent the IFF in the building codes and fire codes. So with that, Stephen, I'll give you the floor. Thanks, Sean. I'm going to start out talking about an environment where there aren't really many building codes as it pertains to fire to look out for you as firefighters. We're going to look at single family home fires. We're going to look at some research that we did at UL, some trends that we're seeing at UL as far as how fires are growing in homes, how that's changed over time. And then we're going to start getting into some tactical considerations, some things for the street level firefighters to keep in mind of how maybe they need to improve their education or change their understanding and behavior because the fire environment's changed on them. The way it used to be 50 years ago, some of the tactics that may have been sound then might not be so sound anymore. And we did a research project to look at what may have to change. What are some things that you may need to think about? And we'll get into all those details. At UL, we've done a lot of research on residential fire environment, everything from furnishings to building envelopes to how the homes are laid out, all trying to understand safety aspects of the home. This slide right here pretty much sums up what I could give in an hour presentation of how the fire environment's changed. Each one of these components, while they might not be significant by themselves or maybe individually they're all significant, when you start adding them up together, you really compound the effect and you really compound what's going to happen, how quickly fires can change. Starting in the top left, larger homes. From the early 70s, your average square footage of your home is about 1,600 square feet. Fast forward to 2008, the last census data shows us that the average square footage of a single family home, 2,600 square feet. So we've increased 1,000 square feet in our homes increase the potential for hazard? Have we increased our staffing proportionally to deal with that hazard? Probably not. In many cases, it's gone the opposite way. Open spaces. It's a big common thing to find now that especially with lightweight construction, the need for low-bearing walls has pretty much gone away. So if you can take one end of your home and open it up to the other end of your home, I know mothers like to be in the kitchen and watch their kids playing on the other side of the house, if you've got open line of sight, you've got rooms that are no longer divided by doorways, they're now completely connected, a couple things happen. One, you've got that much more available oxygen to the fire compartment. The second piece of that is smoke spread, fire spread, all are able to happen much faster because there's nothing to slow it down. Increased fuel loads, this is probably the most significant of the bunch. We've moved from a natural-based fuel load in homes to a completely synthetic-based fuel load in homes. We've moved from cotton furniture to polyurethane furniture. Very different burning characteristics, and we'll watch a video in a second comparing the two of them. Void spaces and changing building materials. I don't have to tell you guys, and Sean's going to talk about this later on, the change to the lightweight construction, changes in windows, changes to doors, changes to the building envelope, what's the outside sheathing of your home has changed dramatically, and he's going to show you some videos that highlight that. You put all these things together, you start getting things like faster fire propagation, shorter times to flash over, rapid changes in fire dynamics, catching firefighters off guard, and then when it comes to shorter escape times for occupants, more life hazard for you to deal with, and then really when it comes down to it, shorter times to collapse, there's some implications there for occupant safety, but the biggest implication there is firefighters going in to affect rescues, and like we've seen in so many line of duty deaths, falling through the floor for an unpro unprotected floor, uh, wood floor assembly. Here's a video. We have a fair amount of resources at UL dedicated to burning things. We've got a 120 foot by 120 foot with a 60 foot ceiling laboratory 
that has smoke scrubbers on it that we can pretty much burn anything we want. This is two rooms put side by side. The legacy room, or what I would consider my grandmother's room, would be stuff that we acquired from an older structure, cotton-based furniture. So the sofa in this case has cotton batting, a cotton cover fabric. All of the furniture in the room is made of solid wood. The children's toys in the room are made of solid wood. And then going over to the modern room, as you're seeing the changes in fire behavior, look at the timeline as we go. We're coming up on just past three minutes. We've got rollover, transitioning to flashover as the floor pyrolyzes. And you've got flashover in less than four minutes. That's all furniture that you go up to your local furniture store and buy today. That's probably what's in all of your homes. We're going to fast forward the legacy room fire. To say that there isn't enough fuel to go to flashover is not true. It just takes the amount of time it takes for it to release its energy takes a lot longer. 29 and a half minutes to achieve flashover. Now put that into the response times of your fire departments. Chances are you're not arriving before the 3 minute and 40 second flashover time, but you were arriving before the 29 minute flashover time. Of course, there's some issues here as to how much air is available and everything else, but we're going to talk about that in the, in the house experiments. You're arriving at a different point in fire growth. Your hazards are very different, and we'll show you that here. I mentioned our big lab. Well, we not only can burn a couple rooms, we can burn a couple houses. So thanks to the uh, AFG Fire Prevention and Safety Research Grants, we were able to, to get some funding to look at taking these changes in fire in homes as well as in the fuel loads and putting them in real houses and examining fire service initial operations. So we've got a 1,200 square foot ranch house, typically of what would be found in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and our 3,200 square foot colonial house, something that you can easily find today, slightly more than average today. And it's got some, some features that are important that we'll talk about. When it comes to doing research, it's very important for me to highlight that it's not just me sitting in a lab doing research. We do research with the fire service, not for the fire service. So here you can see our technical panel of fire service representatives and research representatives from large departments, small departments, career departments, volunteer departments to get input from everybody to make sure that what went into the front end of the research justifies what comes out of the back end of the research and firefighters can buy into what lessons were learned from the research. Here's an important question I want to ask yourself. As a whole, the fire service knows very well how to ventilate, but not necessarily very well what, where, when, and why. And this might catch you, kind of slap you in the face a little bit to start, but if you think about it, how much training does the fire service have in fire behavior? And if you look at typical firefighter curriculums or typical academies, up through the officer level, you're looking at less than 1% of your training. You might get three hours on fire behavior where we talk about this is what flashover is, this is the fire growth curve, this is conduction, convection, and radiation. Bam, you know everything you need to know about fire, kid, go get it. When in fact, we probably spend more time tying ropes and knots and doing other things like how to cut a hole in a roof, how to break a window, how to force a door, but how much time do we really talk about, well, what happens when you do cut that hole in the roof? The things always get better. What happens when you do break that window? Do you always cool off a structure when you break the window? More often than not, if it's not combined with suppression, and that's what the reason for these experiments really was. So as far as the purpose, you can read the purpose there. Of course, improving understanding of fire behavior. And I can't expect you to know more about fire behavior if there's nothing out there that you can learn from to teach your members fire behavior. So if three hours is all that's out there, how can we expect you to teach any more? And that's really we're trying to fill that void, provide more fire behavior knowledge so you have more information that's scientifically based that you can hang your hat on to teach your members. And then the definition of ventilation. Go into the IFSTA definition of ventilation. 
the systematic removal of heated air, smoke, and airborne contaminants from a structure. More often than not, every firefighter I ask will stop their definition right there. Ventilation is letting stuff out. The more important piece of this definition is the second half and replacing them with fresh air. Because then we saw with the increased fuel loads and ventilation limited fires, fuel is never the limiting factor anymore. You have plenty of fuel in your homes to flash a house over several times. Plenty of energy available to burn. Looking at our fire triangle, what's the missing link? More often than not, it's air. How does the fire get air? Either it vents a window by itself or the fire service arrives and opens a door, opens a window. You get your air rush into your ventilation limited fire. That's why we're seeing these rapid fire growth events. And then the pictures on the right. If anybody asks me what's your main motivation for doing this research, so I don't go online and see pictures of firefighters on fire. Are they on fire because they wanted to be? No, they're on fire because they got caught off guard. Things changed quicker than they expected them to change. And they really shouldn't be surprised. That's fire behavior, that's physics. You should be able to know that as you let air into the fire and there's a delay in applying water to the seat of the fire, things like this are gonna happen. We need to make sure that we don't have line of duty deaths because of this and we don't keep seeing pictures of firefighters coming out on fire. We ran 15 different experiments in our lab, eight in the two-story home, seven in the one-story home. You're watching a video, it's a time-lapse video of the home being built in our lab. Seven guys put it up in less than two weeks, double sheetrocked and painted. And the important thing here when it comes to designing experiments is the only variable between tests was the ventilation procedures done by the fire department or by our simulated fire department. Fuel loads were the same, identical throughout. Geometries were the same. Timeline was the same. The only thing that varied was examining simulated initial engine company operations or an engine company and a truck company that show up pretty much simultaneously and go to work together. So we looked at what happens when you just open the front door? What happens when you force the front door open? What does that do to how the fire grows? What if we vent the front door and we also vent a window near the seat of the fire? Kind of like what you're taught in your training manuals. Might make sense, why does it make sense? Let's get some data that supports why you vent near the seat of the fire. Venting far from the seat of the fire. Let's say we don't know where the seat of the fire is and we take a window out on the back of the house. What does that do to the fire? How long does it take to spread to other parts of the house? Ventilating just a window near the seat of the fire. Let's say the fire vents itself prior to your arrival. How does that fire failing a window allow it to grow and how long does it take? And then what I like to call the take in the glass test. Opening the front door and then counterclockwise taking the windows out all the way around the house. In this case, taking out four windows after you open the front door. Here's a 3D rendering of what the house looked like when you cut the roof off. You've got living room in the front, right inside side alpha, you got the front door and the front window there. Dining room to the left, kitchen in the back, three bedrooms, one bathroom and you can see the furnishings in every room. Here's the two-story house. Four bedrooms, two and a half bathrooms, two-story great room in the back with a 17-foot ceiling, two-story open foyer, and an open floor plan on the first floor. So you could see from one side of the corner of the house to the other corner of the house. We had a uh, prominent residential architect design these homes for us based on a floor plan that they use across the country that's fairly common across the country. Fuel loads, we were able to go to a hotel surplus store and get identical fuel loads for every single experiment. We didn't want the ability to say, well, that fire grew differently because it had a different sofa, or that one had two sofas, this house had one sofa. We had identical fuel loads for every single experiment in each house. And you can see some of the furnishings here. Sofas, carpeting, televisions, curtains, kitchen tables, appliances, bedrooms, with uh, dressers, end tables, the whole nine yards. Timeline, this is another important factor. We were very conservative with what we chose as the timeline. 
If you look at the average response time of fire departments across the United States for the last few years, it's about six minutes as a response time. So if we figured being conservative, if the fire gets noticed almost right away, the fire department gets notified, they've got a six minute response time. Let's put a minute on the front for the fire, for the dispatch to get processed. Let's put a minute on the back from the time that they arrive on the scene until they're ready to make entry into the house, kind of a reflex time. So it's eight minutes for the one story house, 10 minutes for the two story house. That gives you a comparison of the amount of time it takes for a home to become ventilation limited. So the two story house, bigger volume, takes a little more time to consume all of the air and generate heat inside that house. We gave it an extra two minutes to accomplish that. After ventilation, we allowed the fire to go to flashover. After it went to flashover, we looked at another phenomena called pushing fire, which is uh, what I'm gonna show you is, is somewhat of a myth. Throwing water from the outside off the ceiling for 10 seconds, what does it do to the temperatures in the house? This is one of the first times in a research project where full houses were actually available for multiple burns. So we were able to instrument it and look at, well, what happens if someone was laying in a back bedroom? Would you putting that fog nozzle through that front window cause that person in the back bedroom to be steamed, increase the heat where they're at, increase the CO or whatever the case may be in order to cause worse things for them because of the choice of host stream application. Here's a sped up version of one of the tests in the one story house. On the right hand side, the two camera views, you're gonna see the fire beginning in the living room. That fire is gonna grow on the sofa. The other views on the left hand side, you can see top left corner is side alpha. Next to that is one of the bedrooms with a closed door. Below that is two bedrooms with an open door. Next four video views, you got side Charlie, a view from the kitchen into the family room, and then your two family, views, family room views on the right. You can see the fire grows, and then what happens? It consumes all the air in the house. It becomes ventilation limited. As it becomes ventilation limited, Gas production goes up, temperature will start to go down, it stays fairly hot, it's waiting for oxygen. In this case, at eight minutes, coming up right now, front door gets vented, eight minutes and 15 seconds, the front window gets vented. So now we're looking at the scenario of front door open, window near the seat of the fire being open. You can see here, fire transitions to flashover, we're gonna go ahead and, in this scenario, throw a smooth bore off the center of the ceiling in the living room. And we can see what that does to conditions within the house. Here's what those temperatures look like. So you're looking at a graph with time across the bottom, temperature on the left-hand side. Temperatures in Celsius, about double it to get Fahrenheit. Scale doesn't matter. In this case, what matters is shape. You notice that the fire grows. Fire runs out of air. When the fire runs out of air, the temperatures begin to decline. As those temperatures decline, if no one showed up and it didn't vent a window by itself, eventually the fire would just go out because it doesn't have any oxygen. In this case, fire department arrives, they make two ventilation openings. And you can see about how long it takes and what happens to the temperatures once those ventilation openings get made. We didn't cool off the fire, we allowed the fire to go to flashover. However, obviously you need to make an opening to go in and put the fire out. The question is, can you put water on the fire in that time period before that fire ramps up? It's all about coordination and we'll, we'll talk about that. All right, so where's the science meet the street? We had hundreds of hours of video we had millions of data points. We got together with our fire service partners. We went through it all, and we came up with a series of tactical considerations for you to keep in mind when you're going to single family home fires. One, the stages of fire development. We just touched on this a little bit. The top left corner is the fire growth curve that you were probably taught in recruit school. The fire grows. 
it goes to flashover, it becomes fully developed, then it decays. That's a pretty good growth curve if you have a set of living room furniture and you put it in a parking lot. When it's got all the air it could possibly want, you light it on fire, that's how it's going to grow. Nice, easy curve. When you take that same set of furniture and you put it in a compartment, the fire growth curve that you really need to worry about is the one in the top right hand corner. Fire grows, it runs out of air. You get an initial decay period. Then when the oxygen gets provided, you get a quick transition to flashover, then it's fully developed and then it decays. It's almost this double humped curve instead of your, your one solid curve. <coughs> Here's an incident that my department in Prince George's County responded to. You had an engine company and truck company arrive almost simultaneously to a small single family house. Fire in the front living room, fire pretty much little smoke showing if any. Engine company dropped their shoulder load in the front porch area. Didn't have a chance to flake it out, they got water quicker than they expected to get water. Truck company goes inside to begin their search, seeing the hose line there, seeing the engine company there. They feel they're coordinated, they go inside to begin their search. The only fuel load in that house, it's a vacant home, the only fuel load in that house was a sofa and a couple other pieces of furniture in the front living room, that's it. That was on fire. Subsequent ventilation practices were taken, they opened it up to try and cool off. Never got water to the nozzle because of the kinks that got involved and I think there was also a cut in the hose line because of a piece of glass that fell on the hose. Two minutes after that first picture, you had two firefighters in the back of the house that I'm going to say got lucky that they're still alive today. They pointed themselves in the right direction and ran through the flames out the front of the house and got helped over the wall into the front yard. The first arriving chief's return was, will somebody please put the two firefighters in the front yard out? They got lucky that they survived. Their turnout gear did what it was supposed to for a very short duration. If they would have got stuck or hit a wall on their way out, they'd probably be a NIOSH report. Risk analysis is a really big thing that the fire service gets told all the time, especially by the public. Why would you go in there? There's no savable lives. This is something we were able to analyze because we had temperature readings and gas readings throughout the house. What we were able to show is if you're remote from the fire and you're near the ground, you may be unconscious, but you're potentially savable. You did not exceed tenability thresholds that are set in the literature for when you are going to be dead. There's a potential that there's a savable life in a lot of these homes, especially if you're behind a closed door. That's something that I need to highlight. If you're behind a closed door, temperature increases were very small. You're less than 100 degrees Fahrenheit in that room with a fully involved fire on the other side of that doorway. Same thing in the two-story house. More bigger volume, more survivable locations, more chances for the fire department to rescue you. Forcing the front door is ventilation. This is something the fire department does not necessarily connect all the time. You'll see a lot of times the first arriving chief on the scene gets there ahead of the suppression apparatus and the first thing he does is he goes to the front door and opens it. Makes sense, he's trying to see what the fire conditions are. He's trying to see if there's anybody that may be passed out by the doorway, anybody that's savable. But then what does he do? Leaves the front door open. That's when the clock starts ticking. And in this case, in those graphs, you see the arrows pointing to when the front door was open, and you can see what's happening to the temperatures inside the house. More air, able to generate more heat, creates more temperature, causes problems. It's very important to control that front door. Same thing goes if the hose line is delayed and the truck company forces that front door open or the bar man on the engine company forces that front door open. If the hose line's not ready to go, shut the door. Letting the hot stuff out is not necessarily as important as allowing that fresh air in. You're gonna transition from a somewhat cool environment waiting for air to a flashover environment because you left the front door open. This is probably the most significant one right here. This is why firefighters are having themselves bailing out of windows and running out of the front doors of homes on fire. What I want you to notice is where we've got that little section right there at the beginning, that's the time from 
ventilation as the air is being allowed in. And in this case, it was about 80 to 120 seconds. And then what do you notice about the curves? They're almost straight up and down. The transition from about 100 degrees Fahrenheit to over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, or in many cases, 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit, is less than 10 seconds. So it almost invites you in. You force the door, good, some air's entering, nice, follow that little tunnel into the house, and then by the time the mixing takes place and that oxygen gets to the seat of that fire, and it starts to take off, from okay to dead could be less than 10 seconds. There aren't a lot of warning signs. Venting near versus venting far from the seat of the fire. Here's another one that you've been taught to vent near the seat of the fire. Well, why does that work? What are you accomplishing? One, if you vent near the seat of the fire and there's no suppression, all you're accomplishing is making the fire bigger, easier, because you're introducing the air right where it's needed. If you coordinate it where line's ready to go in, ventilation point gets made near the seat of the fire, within that first 60 seconds, you're putting water on that fire, awesome coordinated attack. Your ventilation helped that engine company because when the water gets put on the fire, it creates steam. Where's the steam going to go? Path of least resistance. The closer that path of least resistance is to not being back over the top of the engine company and back through the door that they came in, they're going to like your ventilation operation. You make a ventilation point far from the seat of the fire. What are you doing? You're creating a path of least resistance. You're creating a low pressure. The fire creates a high pressure, hence high temperature. It's going to go where the low pressure is. If you make the low pressure on the back side of the house, you will spread the fire to the back side of the house. It's physics. It's not because the fire wants to go there. It's because that is where it has to go because it's a lower pressure. If you coordinate that by making your ventilation opening on the back side of the house, as the hose line is ready to go in, the fire gets knocked down, the steam goes to the low pressure past the engine company, everybody's happy. You don't time that ventilation opening properly. If you make it too early, you spread the fire to the back of the house. If you make it too late, the low pressure is now the door that the engine company is stretching their hose line through, and the steam's coming back over top of them. So it's very important to coordinate and time your ventilation properly. Venting high versus venting low. Here's another one. Venting high is more efficient. Hot stuff goes up. You make your ventilation opening high. The faster the hot stuff goes up and out, the faster the air comes in. So the more efficient you ventilate, the less time you have to get the hose line in place. So venting high is a very smart, efficient thing to do. It's much more effective than venting low. However, the window you have to put water on the fire just shrunk because your air is making it to the fire faster. So if you're pretty confident you're well coordinated, vent high. If you feel that the hose line is going to be delayed, hold off on your ventilation. Simple coordination. How much ventilation do you need? I don't have enough time to go through a lot of this, but the important part here is the more openings we made, the bigger the fire got faster. Shouldn't be too much of a surprise. You can't confuse the fire and make it not sure where to go. If you actually wanted to make enough ventilation for a well-involved living room in the front of this house, you'd actually have to completely remove the front wall and part of the side wall in order to have that fire pull back to the items that are burning. You have a ventilation-limited fire, it's not going to pull back to a fuel-limited fire with the amount of combustibles that are available today. We talked about coordination a lot. Just to add to this, you got about 80 seconds in the one-story house and about 160 seconds in the two-story house that you have to put water on the fire before things start going bad relatively quickly. And you've heard terms in the fire service like venting for fire, venting for life. Really, the one that needs to be thought about is venting for extinguishment. Because if you're not venting in coordination with the fire attack, things are just going to get worse. Tunneling. Everyone thinks that well, I'm going to make a ventilation opening and the smoke's going to lift. Where do, we, where do we see that? Well, more often than not, we see it in our training academies because we're burning in a concrete building with a small fuel load. So when you open up a window, it responds perfectly every time and lifts the smoke. In houses, it doesn't work that way because you have a ventilation-limited fire in a house. 
The best you're going to get is a tunnel inside the front door as the air gets pulled to the seat of the fire. If you see that tunnel, chances are you've got a ventilation limited fire, and if air is pulling past you pretty fast and you don't have a hose line ready to go, your best move is probably to shut the door and wait until the charged hose line is ready to go. Vent under search. Who has vent under search SOPs in their department? Many of you do. Very smart tactic in many cases. The important piece of this, if you vent a second floor bedroom window and that doorway is open, what did you just create? A chimney from the fire, a path of least resistance. Hot gases are coming up and out of that bedroom. The most important thing you can do is isolate that door, or as I like to say, vent, enter, isolate search. As soon as you shut that door, you now broke off your operation from everything else that's happening on the fire ground. You leave that open, you've got about 60 seconds before you're getting chased right back out of that room because you just gave fire in the, you just gave air to the fire in the best place possible. You're letting all the heat out high. I'll hear a lot of people say, well, I can get in, I can search that, I can be done really fast, that's not a problem for me. A lot of ways I've seen vent under search done, you take the ladder from the ground, you break the window. That's time zero, clock starts ticking. You now have to position the ladder, get your mask on, get your gloves on, go up the ladder, clear out the window, get into the room, complete your search, and then get back out. How long does that take? You're not finished that in less than 60 seconds, I promise you. So, God forbid you find somebody, then what? Then it's going to take a heck of a lot more energy, and now you're going to be getting cooked as you're trying to get back out of that window. If you isolate that door, our experiment showed testing of fire ratings of doors. Even a hollow core door is going to buy you five minutes before it's going to burn through with flashover conditions on the other side of it. So if you can get that door shut, the smoke will lift because you cut off the source of the smoke. You can search the room in a cool environment that you can see in and get right back out. A lot of people will teach to open the door back up. I would argue never open that door back up unless water's on the fire. If water's on the fire, go ahead, open it back up and allow it to vent. Don't create another flow path through that bedroom unless the fire's being controlled. Otherwise, you're changing the fire dynamics in the room and you can be causing problems for the guys searching elsewhere in the house. I'm gonna skip this video for the sake of time. It just shows a comparison between a uh, open bedroom and a closed bedroom. We already talked about the impact of a closed bedroom. We always had instrumentation in a closed bedroom and an open bedroom next to each other, and there was probably a thousand degrees difference between the two simply by having a door in between that flow path. And it's not just for occupants. If everything starts going really bad on you in a hurry and you're running for an area refuge and you get to a bedroom, by nature you want to go to the window and either jump out the window or wait for a ladder. The best thing you can possibly do is on your way into that bedroom, get the door shut. If you get the door shut, cuts off the source of the fire, allows the ladder to get to you in a controlled manner, and in many cases it doesn't force you to bail out of the window and jump. Pushing fire, this is the last piece of this. We had a whole bunch of conflicting tactics, whether it was the New York guys, the Chicago guys, East Coast guys, West Coast guys. In no experiment were we able to push fire. Anytime we threw water from the outside onto something that was burning, the temperatures in the entire house went down. We were able to get some steam movement within the house, especially if you used a fog nozzle like right here. You're able to get some steam into the back bedroom. But you took a bedroom that was 400 degrees and it went down to 200 degrees. It might get uncomfortable because it's humid, but chances are you increase survivability by putting any water on the fire whatsoever. All the anecdotal stuff we've heard of people pushing fire, when you actually sit down and talk with them, you find out that, well, they made a vent on the opposite side of the house and they came in and the fire was going that way anyway, regardless of whether any water came in the front or not. It was just an uncoordinated attack. If the back bedrooms are closed, meaning the windows aren't taken out, you can't physically push higher pressure gases into there because they're already hot. The path least resistance is any openings that are made in relation to where that hose stream's getting put in. 
You can't push something back into a room that's already of a higher pressure. I could talk about that for another hour. This is the summary. I've talked about all this already. I want to point you to ul.com forward slash fire service. That web page has an online training uh, scenario set up that covers everything I talked about plus a lot more. If you could send your members to that website, put them through the tactical consideration section, it's narrated, it's got videos, it's got pictures, it explains everything I talked about in more detail. There's also some other projects there about firefighter safety and photovoltaic systems, collapse of lightweight construction buildings, whole bunch of firefighter training materials that are there for free. All you have to do, go there, send your guys there. We have a lot of departments that are developing uh, questions that can be asked, so they're using it as drills, they're using it as continuing education credits and things like that. It's all free, go to that. And this is my contact information right here. I'm gonna turn it over to, are you? I'm turning it over to Jim. Feel free, if you have any questions, send me emails, give me a phone call. I'm there for you guys. If you see any fire behavior that doesn't make sense or you're going through the online training and something doesn't make sense, I'll answer questions for you the best I can. Thank you. And just to follow up, Steve, why uh, we're getting ready for Jim, uh, we did that in Cleveland. We, uh, we have a quarterly Con Ed, and many states like the state of Ohio are starting to go there where they're requiring Con Ed, much like we do for our um, EMS. And uh, we created some questions. We directed everybody to the UL website, and they went through it. And we were able to award CEUs through the state because we came up with the questions. Are you ready, Mr. Tidwell? Sure. Thank you. Um, from personal observation, I can tell you that the UL website is one of the best I've seen in terms of training and, and the level of really solid, well-researched information that, that you're going to find. <clears throat> so I'd encourage you to take advantage of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm here today to talk a little bit about the green movement and, uh, and how it's impacting fire service, how, it, how it's impacting firefighter safety. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> um, both from a prevention aspect and a, a tactical and strategic aspect on the fire ground. One of the things that I tell, especially firefighters at this point in time, I think everybody's aware of the lightweight construction and, and some of the problems that lightweight construction has, has presented to the fire service. But lightweight construction has been around for a heck of a long time. And the green movement, while it's been around, hasn't been around nearly as long as lightweight construction. And I think what you're going to find is that if we, the fire service, don't get involved now, in trying to help shape and guide the green movement to help make sure that there aren't these unintended consequences from construction techniques and construction materials, then in 20 or 25 years, we're gonna be looking back and saying the same thing about the green movement that we're now saying about lightweight construction. So I would encourage you to get involved on a local, state, and national level. Uh, anytime there's, there's a regulatory uh, issue coming, coming up, that you give your best advice and you let the regulators or the developers of those regulations know just how that's gonna impact you on the fire ground. And we're gonna talk about a few of those things. In the, in the green development industry, these are some of the issues that are gonna present uh, problems for you. Again, either in the planning stage or in the execution phase when uh, when you actually have an emergency in one of these buildings. Let's talk about site design for a minute. Every developer wants to use every square foot of dirt that they can possibly use to build a building on. And that just goes to the money aspect of development. Um, so what you wind up with in a, if they're trying to get lead certification or they're building to some green construction code, all of those codes are gonna require landscaping, more landscaping than, than they're used to and usually in the form of shrubs and trees. The green codes and the green movement do not like concrete. They do not like asphalt. They don't even like turf grass because turf grass has to be mowed regularly. That's a lawnmower. That is, uh, that's polluting the air. And the, the turf grass areas won't soak up as much water as a 
a landscaped area with trees and shrubs and mulch. So what happens is, is you're used to, or I'm used to, seeing a fire lane that's 20 or 24 feet wide, red stripes, concrete. That's what we're gonna put our fire truck on. Not in one of these, not in one of these developments. What you're gonna wind up seeing is all kinds of alternative ways to support the load of the apparatus, um, but still meet the, the, the green criteria. That's if the developer understands the need to get apparatus to the building. Sometimes what you're gonna see is like this building, you're gonna see a lot of trees planted on the curb line or near the building because that's the only space they have to, to place their landscaping. And, and it's going to inhibit your ability to ladder that building should a fire occur. Um, traffic calming is a, is a big deal. One of the green aspects is to reduce the amount of traffic. And when you do have traffic, it needs to be as slow as possible. And that's to encourage pedestrian uh, usage of, of the space. So you're gonna see more speed humps, more chicanes, more choke points, uh, narrower roadways, because narrow roadways, it's a, it's a design aspect. The narrower the road, the, the slower a person is going to drive. That's just, just human nature. So what you're faced with is trying to find a way to accommodate the developer's needs and still get your, get your apparatus where it needs to go. And we're talking about roll down curbs, drivable sidewalks, um, innovative ways to create paths for fire apparatus and for firefighters. Steve talked a lot about building construction and ventilation limited fires as opposed to um, uh, uh, fuel limited fires. And in, in residential occupancies, it's unlikely you're gonna get a room big enough uh, to furnish enough air to actually have a, uh, a fuel limited fire. However, in some of these commercial buildings, when you get the really big atrium uh, with a lot of combustibles in that space, especially if the, if the atrium is open to the floors. Now, currently the building code only allows three floors to be open, but there are all kinds of variances being issued at the local level to those kinds of requirements. But this is going to create the, uh, the opposite. This is going to be a fuel controlled fire as opposed to a ventilation controlled fire. So you're not gonna worry quite as much about ventilation as you are getting enough water um, to stop the fire. Alternative power sources, the, 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 the whole, not the whole green movement, but a lot of the green movement is being driven by energy conservation. Trying to figure out ways to conserve energy or generate energy uh, where we weren't doing it before. We want to, they want to limit the number of power plants being built and this is one way to do it. So what you're seeing is a lot of, of, a lot of solar panels and a lot of wind turbines are out there. The, some of the issues with, let's just use uh, solar panels, uh, photovoltaic cells for an example. They're creating energy, they're generating energy in direct current. Your building uses energy, electricity in, in an alternating current. So the, the solar cells feed what's called an inverter and that inverter may be anywhere in the building. Uh, it's typically pretty close to a meter. S the problem is that there's no way to cut off the current between the solar panel and the inverter other than to cover the, the, the solar panel with an appropriate material. And the key is appropriate material. Um, some of the things that, that you think are going to create enough shade for that solar panel won't. And, and again, UL has done that testing and it's, uh, I believe the results are online if you wanna look at them. So one of the things from a firefighter perspective you're looking at is you go pull the power, you pull the meter or you cut the power to a building or even the power company cuts power to a building. The circuit between the solar panel and the, uh, and the inverter is still gonna be energized. And it's energized at at a uh, current that can be deadly. This is not something you're gonna get a tingle. This is something that, that can kill you. So anytime that you see solar panels, and most of these buildings are required to be labeled and so on, just be aware 
that there's, there's most likely uh, live circuits in that building regardless of what you've done with the power. Wind turbines have the exact same thing going for them. They create power in, in direct current and it's, uh, it's shut off at the inverter. The advantage a wind turbine has from our perspective is that the inverter can be programmed to apply the brakes to a wind turbine when it loses, uh, when, when you shut the power down. And that, when the brakes are applied, the wind turbine will stop generating electricity and it will in fact kill the, uh, uh, the current. In order for that to happen, somebody is going to have to tell the person doing the installation that you're interested in that, that you want that, and, and it's, it might even be worth creating a local regulation because that's not something that's in any of the national codes right now. Hydrogen fuel cells are coming along nicely. Um, this, this one on the screen is one from uh, UTC. They've set it up so that they can reform natural gas, if you have natural gas to the facility, into hydrogen, hydrogen into a, into a, a fuel cell, and they're generating electricity that way. Uh, they're far quieter than typical diesel generators. They've got a lot of advantages to diesel generators from uh, a site uh, perspective. From our perspective, you know, high, uh, high pressure hydrogen tanks are probably something we don't deal with every day, but you need to be aware that they're going to be there. The downside of this technology right now is cost. They've not figured out a way to make it as cost effective as diesel generators, and chances are until they do, you're not going to see them really proliferate. But I suspect over the next several years, they're going to figure out a way to drive the cost, either drive the cost of these down or drive the cost of the other generators up, or create some kind of a tax incentive the way they've done for solar and, and, and wind energy. Um, Battery technology is evolving very, very quickly. Everybody's seen the lithium ion and the, the, the standard ion batteries. And there are some real questions as to what extinguishing medium to use on large lithium battery fires. Because what you've got is you've got a flammable metal or a combustible metal fire. And um, uh, most of the MSD sheets just say copious amounts of water. But all of you understand what happens when you put water on a metal fire. So if you have a large storage facility full of these batteries, just understand that they may react just like you would expect a, a combustible metal fire to react and plan appropriately. One of the things, this is probably the most cost effective way to save energy anywhere. It's through the use of foam insulation. We're seeing uh, open cell foam, closed cell foam, spray on foam, foam board, foam inside the house, foam outside the house, inside of buildings, outside of buildings, foam in, 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 in this case, these are, uh, uh, they call it SIPs, I think they're structurally uh, insulated panels or something like that. And there's, there's styrofoam in between two pieces of chipboard and that makes the structure of the house. Um, there's a lot of BTUs in foam. And regardless of what kind of fire retardant you put in it, that fire retardant is only going to inhibit the ignition for some period of time. And usually that period of time is not very long. So what you wind up with is a substantial fire load. I mean, you saw the Monte Carlo fire probably in, uh, in Vegas. I don't know how many of you saw the, the, the Beijing fire of the, uh, uh, the news complex building in Beijing. 50-story building that had exterior foam insulation, fireworks caught it on fire. That building is currently standing, but it's completely burned out and they don't know what to do with it. The reason they don't know what to do with it is because there's an, another building next to it and they were built as one unit. They were built to be dependent upon one another for structural stability. They're actually connected to each other. So they can't tear the one building down, even though it's burnt out, without figuring out how to keep the other building upright. So, uh, but if you, if you go on YouTube or somewhere like that and look at the video of that 50-story building on fire, you get a real sense of what this foam is, is capable of on the exterior of buildings. 
The problem, another problem is the, the energy folks, the Department of Energy and, and, and the people that are driving this whole energy conservation movement see foam as their primary solution, their very best solution. And they haven't, they haven't really understood the fire service perspective or the fire hazard that they're creating. There's a, a, a document called ASHRAE 90.1. It's an energy code for commercial buildings. And they're talking about requiring up to 10 inches of foam on the exterior of a commercial building. Not as an option, as a requirement. So you, you can, you can kind of see where that's, that's leading from a fire perspective. Um, energy management systems are being tied together. Uh, a friend in, in uh, California was telling me that, that they've noticed that in their universities where they have fume hoods, in a, in a chemical lab, a fume hood, when you open the front of door, the fans come on, it starts evacuating the, uh, uh, the air from under the hood. It's, a, it's, it's, it's pure safety uh, to create, or to make sure you don't create a toxic or a flammable environment under that hood. Well, the, the, the environmental control people are coming in and they're tying all of the fans and all of the uh, uh, HVAC systems together balancing controls to make sure that they're saving as much energy as they can possibly save. And she said they, they found energy control systems tied to the vent hoods and overriding the safety features of a vent hood. And this is in a science lab where they're, they're using toxic chemicals, biological chemicals, flammables, all sorts of stuff. So the, the, a lot of people that are doing your energy audits and they're coming back and, and revising the systems in these buildings don't fully understand the safety aspect of, of what they're dealing with. Um, innovations in glazing, you know, you got double pane windows, triple pane windows, low E glass that interferes with your, your radio uh, transmissions. Now you're getting windows with a low voltage electrical charge to change the opacity of the window. So when you start breaking these windows, uh, you, you've got live energy circuits within the window itself. You're gonna find wires, you're gonna find live wires in places you never dreamed you would find live wires. Green roofs or vegetative roofs are, uh, can be problematic if, if the structure was not, uh, was not designed to, to carry the load. Uh, you know, 50 or 75 years ago, these, you didn't have a lot of these, but, uh, but they weren't a big problem but you combine a vegetative roof with lightweight construction and now you've got the worst of both worlds. Um, your, your safety factors on load carrying capacity can, can simply be ne uh, negligible a lot of times. Uh, Factory Mutual has a data sheet that's, that gives some very, very good guidance on how they should be designed, what to look for, uh, pitch of the roof, those kinds of things. Uh, what you're gonna see is everything from very, very low growing vegetation on these roofs uh, to some pretty high uh, prairie grasses, which are real pretty, uh, until the prairie grass, until they come under. I'm from Texas. We don't have any water right now in Texas. 98% of the state is in a severe drought condition or extreme drought condition. And water restrictions are everywhere. So you put one of these green roofs up there and then you run out of water, you can't irrigate it, what do you have? you probably have a fire problem. Um, and if the pitch is too high, you can get a mudslide off of one. These little white boxes on this roof, this happens to be in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, the guy that owned the building when it was being built, this is a LEED certified platinum building. He heard that bees were, uh, were not reproducing, were, were, uh, were being killed off, as it were. So we, we weren't getting enough germination in the, in the crops. So, in order to help the bee population in Charlotte, North Carolina, he put beehives on his roof. Um, I don't know if your turnout gear is, is geared for that or not. Urban villages, real quickly, are, I mean, New York City, Chicago, um, San Francisco, some of the older cities, they've had the equivalent of urban villages since, they're, since they were uh, founded. These are very, very compact uh, communities. They typically will have living, retail, and entertainment all in the same building or all in the same block. 
they will limit vehicular access as much as they can. Uh, they will encourage pedestrian use as much as they can. Again, what that does for us is it gives us a, a, a whole lot of new issues in how to get in there and address any kind of a fire or, in a lot of cases, even an EMS response. Um, some communities are looking for cash rooms where they put most of the tools from an apparatus in, in strategically placed rooms throughout the, uh, the facility or the development. The only issue with that or the cautionary note to that is that creates another inspection problem because if you really want to depend on those cash rooms, you have to have somebody in there doing inspections to make sure that your air bottles are kept up to date and hydrostated the way they're supposed to and hose and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it may be better than not having anything at all, but it, it creates new issues. Um, one of the places you can go for more resources, this is, uh, this is a, doc, uh, a report that I wrote with, with Jack Murphy from here, well, he's actually from Jersey City. And it's online, it's downloadable, it's free, and it's greenbuildingfiresafety.com. Uh, this was at the behest of the National Association of State Fire Marshals, and uh, I just wanted to mention it. To, it's, it's about 80 pages, and it's a pretty easy read. It doesn't give you any solutions, it only, it only gives you problems. It only defines what the issues are that you're going to have to deal with. Um, some of the code issues that are coming up in ICC's Green Code and some others. There's a provision that someone, now, now this, this Green Code is gonna be published in the first quarter of next year. It's a document that's intended to be uh, compatible with the other ICC codes. The I International Building Code is the code that's being adopted in the United States right now. And so I think you can look for communities looking for a Green Code this is probably going to be the code of choice. The final action hearings to make the final determination as to what goes in the document are coming up in late October of this year. They've been through about a two and a half year process so far, and these are some of the issues that have come up. Gray water to fire pumps. Not only do they allow it, they would encourage it if, if that passes. Now right, right now, uh, the committee has voted not to include that regulation, but it's going to come up later this year. Um, vestibules. One of the ways you save a lot of energy in the energy code and the green code is you create these vestibules. I don't know about you, but if I'm stretching a line through a door, the last thing I want to see is another door right there, but, but that's what you're going to see going in the future. This is, this is another design choice that, that a lot of architects and engineers are making uh, for the sake of energy conservation. Straw bale construction has been around for, I don't know, 30, 40 years, a long time. It's never made it into the codes, and, and you, you, can, you can come up with as many reasons as I can for the reason why. But the, the promoters, the, green pe the, green, the greenies, the promoters of, of straw bale construction saw this green code as an opportunity. And they have come back at every single hearing trying to get regulations in here for straw bale construction. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a nightmare for the fire service and I think for the public at large. Um, one, of the, one of the special interest groups submitted two different code change proposals to eliminate standpipe requirements in all green buildings. If you build it to the green code, you don't need a standpipe system. So far, we've, 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 we've kept that, uh, the, the committee has voted against it, but it's, uh, uh, it's coming back. We talked about uh, the photovoltaic cells location and design. Uh, the concept is to provide firefighters with space on top of a roof that has PV cells uh, space to operate, space and space to ventilate. Uh, the, the 2012 fire code, uh, IFC, is going to have essentially the California provisions embodied in it. So uh, we're working on that. And then Sean can tell you all about the protection of lightweight construction. He's been working a lot on that, especially as it relates to uh, uh, residential construction. 
From an operational perspective, I think we've talked about most of these. The fire growth is going to be quicker. Ventilation techniques are going to need to be reconsidered. That's another place the research from UL is, is really, uh, 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 it's really good to have. Um, energized circuitry, we talked about that, and we talked about apparatus access. So, Sean? Thank you. I appreciate your patience and, um, and you guys being here today because this is the first day we've been here where it didn't rain, I don't think. And you guys picked the most exciting class that was on the schedule. Oh, thanks. How many saw building codes and said, I've got to be in that class? But um, Yogi was in here yesterday, and Yogi sat through a two-hour presentation at the American Burn Association conference in Chicago that the IFF represented two hours on building codes, and yet he came back for more yesterday. So it's not that bad. Because what we, you know... Um, Oh, I need to stay in the, run to the light, Carol Ann. Okay. Um, maybe asking why the building codes. You know, this is the health and safety and EMS conference for the IFF. So, uh, but why not the building codes? I was the secretary for our local for eight years, and we sat down, and some of the responsibilities we have as, as local leaders to, is to negotiate good wages and uh, good wealth or health benefits and also good working conditions for our members. And doing that, you start to do some research and find out the value, what are the risks our members take, and they should be compensated relatively to those risks. So we sit there, and since the days when Ben Franklin started the fire service in the United States, we have continuously tried to reduce the risk of fire and also improve firefighter safety. Yet every year, we continually look back, except for the last couple of years, that we were losing 100 firefighters per year. And about 80,000 firefighters were being injured. So there had to be another way. We improved our training. We improved our equipment. What were we missing? So on a dare, I went to a code hearing. And at that code hearing, I started to, started to figure out what we were missing. Um, just real quickly, NFPA, uh, you know, they provide different reports annually. But where do they get the information for these reports? Does anybody know? The US Fire Administration. Where does the U.S. Fire Administration get this information? From the state fire marshal. Who does the state fire marshal get the information from? Us. So when it's 2 o'clock in the morning, we don't really feel like filling out that inference report completely. It has a direct result in the standards, the codes, the, uh, the dissemination of, of grants, and what the fire picture is that, that is out there. So after getting off the soapbox of that, of filling out your inference reports completely, and accurately, we looked at NFPA did, issued a report in 2000. It's a little dated here, but if you look at the work that Gavin Horn has done at the Illinois Fire Safety Institute, it still holds true. We're see, we are seeing a reduction in firefighter deaths, but we're seeing a reduction in the number of fires. So what we have noticed is that the number of firefighters per fire has actually started to increase a little bit. It's been stable, but it's starting to increase a little bit. In this report, NFPA looked at the death rate per incident. In the 1970s, they found that 5.8 firefighters died per 100,000 structure fires. In the late 1990s, that number was about 5.7. So it's kind of in line. But if we look at the numbers a little bit closer, we saw that deaths due to cardiac arrest were dropping from 2.6 to 1.9 per 100,000 structure fires. So it, it kind of saw us that maybe the health and wellness programs we've been doing have had a positive effect. And then we looked further into it, and we looked at the firefighter deaths due to traumatic injuries went from 1.8 per 100,000 structure fires to almost three. So what are we doing wrong? How is that number jumping that, that high when we've increased our training, we've increased our awareness, we've increased our education? You know, we, we go to some of the contributing factors, and I always kid because Steve Kerber gives me this stare when I put this last, next slide up, but it's to make a point. It's in the, our terminology. We see that fires burn hotter. Well, they don't necessarily burn hotter. It's just more energy is, be creating, is being created earlier in the event. We're facing a larger fire upon our arrival, and Steve's video showed that very, very dramatically. We also have the increased use of thermoplastics in our home, little tykes toys, your TVs, uh, 
computers, all of that's being added, all of that is petroleum-based fuel into the home. And of course, polyurethane foam, but we saw the dangers of that in a super sofa fire. But you also saw it on a, at a in-home level with Steve's video. That's a, that's a can of gasoline sitting right there in the front room that we're having to deal with. Has our turnout gear, the enhancements in our turnout gear and the encapsulation of our members allowed us to get in the places that we shouldn't be in? We can argue that back and forth, but I tend to say yes. We're not recognizing the changes in the atmosphere around us. The insulation factors, Jim hit upon you know, the, the multiple panes of glass, the low E. We're, we're seeing the introduction of foam. We're encapsulating that environment and trapping that heat in. And also the building codes are allowing less mass and the protection trade-offs. In a 2000 building code, there were 200 trade-offs for sprinkler protection, approximately. In the 2006 code, there were over 400. Meaning that if you put sprinklers in, and sprinklers are fantastic, we support the use of sprinklers, but over 400 times, then you can reduce the, the other protection, the passive protection in there. Whether it's you go from a two hour rated wall down to a one hour rated wall, or from a one hour rated wall to a zero rated wall, just a curtain. Now what happens if those sprinklers don't operate? Because we have mechanical problems. We did a survey in Cleveland in 1997, we found over a thousand buildings where the sprinkler systems were compromised, over a thousand. And yet we're gonna trade off protection trade-offs due to those sprinklers being present. So but why the codes? Why the interest from the international in the codes? Well, the international, you know, they take an interest in our health and safety, and they take an interest in our work environment. But what is our work environment? Is it the station house? I think the station house is our staging area. That's where we go to group, gather our resources, and get ready to respond to an incident. The work environment that we go into, that our members go into, is every building that's built out there. That's where we go and operate. That's where we apply our trades. And how are those buildings built? How are they designed? To the building code. How are they maintained? What regulates their, the maintenance in those buildings? The fire code. Who's responsible for the maintenance of the fire code and the application of the fire code and adherence to it? We are, the fire, the fire service. So it's incumbent upon us to get ahead. And some people ask me, why would we ever get involved in the building code? Well, it's building your work environment. Industry always advocates you getting involved in your work environment, improving your work environment. So we should also be involved. Now there are a couple of code processes out there. And like I said, we've got a lot of information. So I may talk a little quickly and I do apologize, but we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this stuff. I wanna get to what we're doing within these processes. There are two national processes. There's the NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association. Their building code really hasn't been adopted in the United States, but the Life Safety Code 101 is, and also one, their fire code. Plus the numerous, over 300 standards, most of them do apply to the fire service. There's also the International Code Council's family of codes. There are 14 or is it 15 now with the, the green code, with the family of codes. The International Building Code has been adopted pretty much in every single state. And the International Fire Code is adopted in about half of them. So you, you, you split half with NFPA 1, roughly. Those aren't hard figures. But those are the national codes. Do you have to be involved in the national codes to be effective? No. What about your local code? One of the stories I tell back in um, 1983, we lost one of our members into a building on, on St. Clair in Cleveland, a non-sprinkler building, Danny Pescatrice. Ran out of air and, and he died. And um, that's how we got our past devices in the city of Cleveland. But uh, later on, oh, I'd say 1996, the owners of that building wanted a variance on sprinkler protection. This whole section of the building, they were trying to s subvert the code and go up to the zoning board and ask for relief on the sprinkler protection. Our fire prevention marshal, our fire marshal was fighting them, and finally he, he came to the local. And he said, guys, listen, they're gonna get this variance in front of the zoning board. We need some help. So we got about 45 or 50 firefighters and we walked into that hearing room with the zoning board. They're sitting at the table in the front room. We just had 45, 50 firefighters. Not, didn't have to say a word. All we had to do was sit there in the room and let the fire marshal speak. And the fire marshal gave his testimony, gave the history of everything and he ended it by saying, we've lost one member in this building. We're not gonna lose another. That owner didn't have a chance. He threatened, I'm gonna take my business and my seven employees elsewhere. And the zoning board found against him. And he was really ticked off at us, but so be it. 
you know what, he's still there. And the building sprinkler. So that's a success. You know, that's what's being involved in the local level can have success on the safety of your membership. You don't even have to say a word sometimes. You just have to stand there. So just a couple of quick things to, to add on to what we're gonna talk about. How many remember from their academy days the E84 test, the Steiner Tunnel Test and the Essentials? Okay, Steiner Tunnel Test measures what? Flame spread rating, right? Based on a couple of tragic incidents like the Coconut Grove fire and the Wincoff Hotel fire down in Atlanta. But it's based against red oak. Now there are some that can give a false rating, such as vinyl siding or polyurethane foam, and we'll get into that in a minute. And that's just a picture of the Steiner Tunnel Test, but because I have to stay in the light, I can't walk over there and, 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 and show you. But you see, the, you see the pictures, or the windows right there, and that's how they measure the flame spread. Well, what happens with some of those vinyl products and those foam products? They melt when they're exposed to fire. So the flame doesn't spread, but you get a big pool of, of liquid fuel fire. So they get a good class A flame spreading of zero to 25. What are we interested in? Well, we're interested in the test that's gonna determine whether they can carry a load or collapse and protect that building against collapse. And that's the E119 test. And that's a furnace test that's designed to put a full load, 100% load on that product. And you put it to, in the first five minutes, it gets up to 1,000 degrees then 1,700 in the first hour, and then it goes up and up and up, up to four hours. So we're concerned with the columns, the beams, the floor and roof assemblies, the walls. Those are what's applied to the 119 test. So you'll see some products that are running out there, and I don't want to name them because I don't want to be liable, no burn, that go out to fire departments and put up a little piece of wood in the back of the, the fire station and see, see, it's not catching on fire. It's as good as sprinklers or it's as good as a fire, you know, one hour rating. Wrong. They're applying it to the wrong test standard. Make sure when you go to a comparable or you're listening to somebody that they're comparing apples and apples and not apples and oranges because it has very dangerous consequences for our members. Because what, what this system has to do to pass that uh, rating is it has to support that load. And it has to bar any flame passage. Once flame starts going through that assembly, it fails. One object at 250, or I'm sorry, an average of 250 degrees on the other side, or one object at 325. So it, those are the passing ratings. So now that I've established that, we'll get back to the one, the, the case scenario that really got the IFF I involved in, in this. And that was August 13, 2006. We were at the Toronto Convention. And word came that Brother Arnie Wolf died in a, in a house fire in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Did everything right. Brother Wolf and his partner, Sister Brinkley, went in the front door, started searching, sounding the floor. It sounded solid. They were very, very early into their search pattern when there was a catastrophic collapse. And Brother Wolf ended up in the room of origin. Sister Brinkley ended up on the other side, partially protected by a cinder block wall and the floor. And she was able to effect rescue a lot with the assistance of the guys on the fire ground. So but this really started. Hey, is this house up to code? How could it collapse so early? What's going on here? And so we saw the house was built with lightweight construction. So we went to the uh, residential code and we said, listen, in the NIOSH report, it says that we should get involved in the codes and require protection on both sides of that floor assembly so we could prevent this type of collapse. We can protect our members in the future. And if anyone ever seen that Bill Cosby skit that he does when his wife gets really mad or having a kid and she throws a conniption, I think the home builder representative on the committee actually had a conniption. He started pulling his hair out because we were asking for a floor assembly, 30 minute barrier, which would have been expensive, but we didn't care about expense. But, uh, but it got talking. And what they kept coming back to us and saying, you have no data. You have no data to support that your members are experiencing this or that these floors fail any quicker than another floor, a protected floor. Well, we didn't have any test data because no one's gonna go spend $20,000 to test the fire resistance of a combustible floor when it's gonna be zero and they're not gonna pass it. Why would they do it? So at this time, now comes my commercial for UL. You can see, I could walk over there and point out where the um, gusset plates. You know, we hear a lot of problems with gusset plates, but the main problem here is, the gusset plates go 3 eighths of an inch into the wood, is wood is combustible. Wood burns away from those gusset plates and they can't hold it any longer. 
So we went to the International Residential Code, and in the intent, it says the purpose of this code is to establish blah, 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 and then down here, to provide safety to firefighters and emergency responders during emergency operations. This didn't used to be in the code. Someone went to apply this to the code, it got turned down, then we saw it, and we took it in rebuttal or public comment, and we tried to get into the code, and who spoke against this? The National Association of Home Builders. And they said, Larry Brown, the representative said, trust us, we're looking out for the firefighter's safety. We just don't think it should be in writing. I went to the microphone and said, Larry, I've been negotiating with the city for 12 years. I don't trust anything unless it's in writing. So uh, we actually got into the code. Now our international uh, Canadian brothers and sisters are trying to get this language into their code right now. And they're hitting the same thing with industry. So they weren't successful this time, but they're gonna have to wait to 2015 but we will ensure that it gets in the Canadian code. So this is the current language in the residential code. It says, floors construction shall be capable of accommodating all loads and load, resulting load supporting structural elements. Is there anything in there about performance and fire? No. So they could build it. As long as it can support the load, it's fine. And that's where the lightweight construction comes from. It's a wonderful product when it's carrying load because it's cost effective and it can carry a great amount of load, but when it's subject to fire, it fails very quickly. And this is one of the things, um, this is where the commercial for UL comes in. Right around this time, UL got the grant from AFG to study, how many have seen this video? Have you seen this video? Great, I'm not gonna play the whole thing, but uh, basically within one minute, the floor system becomes involved in the fire. It becomes part of the, the structural, it becomes a structure fire at that time. It becomes part of the fuel package. But what happens when that occurs? Yep, you start to lose the load carrying capability. And we have catastrophic collapse at five minutes and 57 seconds. And that's when it fails the 119 test at five minutes and 57 seconds. But that doesn't give us much time. So we started getting this data. We started going, okay, here's some data that we can start to show the performance of these floors. And what happened? Okay, we're good. So. During that time also, Tyco Industries, which was promoting residential sprinklers, ran a similar test, except they used uh, the, the front room makeup, and they started a fire in a trash can next to a, uh, a couch. And they got flash over between three and a half to four minutes. And they saw a collapse between nine and a half and 11 minutes in their test. You take out that three and a half, four minutes to flash over, you start getting really close to that six minutes, don't you? So it starts to be consistent. At the same time, the National Research Center of Canada did a study, and they weren't looking at firefighter safety, they were looking at occupant safety. And if the occupant had a tenable atmosphere, and at what point they did not. Now with the door to the basement open, you would think that the uh, atmosphere became very untenable quickly, but much to what Steve has been doing, it actually provided the ventilation for the fire to grow quicker. And they found that the tenable or there was still a tenable atmosphere for those occupants when the floors collapsed. So if there's a tenable atmosphere for that occupant, what does it mean for us? We're going in. Very similar time frames to what we saw in the UL tests. So we took these three tests together and we went back to the codes and as we applied this in, all of a sudden, after, our, after Brother Wolf died, there was a conversation on, on legality and whether there, was, there should be a liable charge and the whole discussion centered around whether the homeowners or the home builders knew they were installing a faulty product when it came to the performance and fire. So all of a sudden with all this data, we removed that cloak of ignorance, didn't we? They could no longer claim that we didn't know. We didn't know how these products perform. So we took this data and said, now you do know. Now you do know. So they called us right the evening of the hearing and said, we'd like to talk. And you know, every, when you compromise, everyone walks away feeling kind of dirty. And you know, I remember wanting to go right back to the hotel and take a shower. But we looked at, before the hearing, we had no protection. If we compromise, we have protection. So we did compromise a little bit. We got a half inch, starting with the adoption of the 2012 code, you will have required for lightweight construction, a half inch piece of chipboard on the bottom side of that basement floor or ceiling. You know, there are some exceptions. We have an exception in there if you have a residential sprinkler system installed. We have some exception in there that they're allowed 80 square feet within 
that structure of unprotected areas, and that was mainly for their ventilation ducts. They didn't want to cut and paste all that drywall around the ventilation ducts. Okay, like I said, it's a compromise. But it also gives us time to look at the further stuff that we have coming down the line. And I know we have five minutes with your indulgence. If you give me five extra minutes, I really appreciate it. And we'll finish because I know it's a beautiful day out there. But it just isn't wood construction that we're concerned with. Steel is making its way into the marketplace because it's, it's recyclable and it's easy to use. The Iron, American Iron and Steel Institute puts this out. They estimate it takes six cars to build, recycled cars to build a house. Here's a metal house down in New Orleans right by those high power lines. Uh, good combination, especially with some of the wet weather that comes through New Orleans, but something to be cognizant of. What's behind the exterior makeup of that building? Know your building when it's being built and what you're dealing with structurally. Here's a floor system. This is a, a residential you know, um, neighborhood in Columbus, Ohio. So you pull up on the scene, you look at the houses in the background, what's your size up? I got a working fire, two and a half story, occupied residential, uh, wood frame construction. No, you don't. You have, you have some steel flooring in there. Now the American Iron and Steel Institute recommends that you cover that with half inch chip board on the bottom. Not for fire performance, but for, st for structural stability to keep that floor from wobbling a little bit. So here's a house that took a few Yugos to build, but you can see the whole structural framing out of metal. And this is a house that was in Cleveland, Ohio. As you can see, there's a union electrician that did some of the work in here. They have combustible materials in the floor space or in the, in the void space there. But we had smoke in the basement and we, went, we came down the steps and this was a little wood shop area where he had power tools and where he did his little hobbies. And then we walked into this like nice big sitting area finished and he had a big plasma screen TV. He had a kitchenette with the stove and refrigerator and he had a sleeping area back there, a couple of recliners, nice setup. But he was a careless smoker and he had discarded a, smoke, a cigarette in a plastic wastebasket. But he was a very nice gentleman. He said, hey, do you mind if I bring the whole box company down and take a look? And we walked down the steps and every guy, to a guy, walked right through this workroom and walked into the finished area. I said, what do you guys think? They go, nice layout, this is bitching. And I go, look up. And all of a sudden they look up and there it is, 24 inches on the center, unprotected steel construction. You're gonna call, take right in the front door of this house and not know what's underneath you if there's a fire in that workroom. So that's what happens to steel floors when they're exposed to fire. Now we can, do, we can debate what's the failure rate? Is it the deflection? Is it total collapse? That's for a later day, another work that Steve is doing right now. But it's not just about residential construction in the code. We, these are, this is just in the last cycle. How many things affect our members and, how, and the safety of our members in the codes? And one is the fire command center size. We don't think about it, but it used to be a little closet. Now it's been doubled in size. You can actually work in there and have some space. Emergency radio operability. This to me was one of the best things that came out of the code cycle and not many of our members know about it. How many experience radio problems in a number of the buildings in their jurisdiction? In Cleveland, in our headquarters, we have a two-story building. We have our command staff meeting in the basement. The drivers have to sit on the ground floor with the radios and come down and tap one of the BCs on the shoulder if they have a run. You know, uh, we had, <laughs> our policy was to put the coat in, because the water department bought these radios and they were not uh, water resistant. So we had to put the radios inside the coats. And if you got into trouble to call a mayday, you had to open your coat, turn it to channel 15 and call for mayday but no one monitored channel 15. So, but 9-11 uh, kind of brought it to the forefront. And in the code now, it says that our radios, our radios have to work in 97% of that building, determined by us. So we can go in there, we can do our radio tests and say, they're not working. If you have to put a booster system, you have to put a leaky system, whatever system that building owner has to install to ensure your radios work, they have to do it. And it's not just for new buildings, it's also in the fire code. So it's existing buildings within 18 months of adoption have to come up with that. That's huge for our members and that operational ability on the fire ground. Furniture stores, we got them sprinklered after the super sofa fire. We had a zero threshold, but it got modified to 5,000 square feet. 
So they used to be 20,000 square feet, but now after 5,000 square feet, they have to be sprinkler. We talked about roof gardens. Up until this last code cycle, they weren't regulated at all. You look on the south side here, I'm watching them lay sod down. There's no, now you have to clean the vegetation off twice a year. You have to put in class A flame spread materials around it. You have to have gaps. They're, they're limited to size. You have to water them. We talked about the wall coverings. We went to 286 testing instead of the 84. So it's not a horizontal application now. It's a corner test to make sure what the real flame spread is. Uh, escape windowsill height, standpipes, uh, elevator issues. Jason Averill's in here from NIST. And Jason's sitting on, there on a committee right now that we just got the hardening of the shafts uh, of not only the fire service elevator, but the passenger access elevators. We're, we're seeing that passenger egress elevators will be in the building near you that are being built to the new code. Where we're telling people not to go to the elevators, now we're telling them to go to the elevators to help with egress in, in tall buildings. But now we have standardized fire service keys. So you don't have to be Mr. Jingling with all those keys. You have one key that can access all those fire or all those elevators. And if you don't, they have to put a Knox box in the lobby that you can access so you can, so you can access the key for that elevator. But going back to what I was just talking about, after all these wins, and in a super tall high rise, 420, square, 420 feet or higher, we got an extra stairwell put in for fire service operations. There's a code committee sitting right now trying to remove elevator lobbies, trying to remove additional protections in these buildings. These high rise buildings where we have a reflex time that's extended and occupants are gonna have to find an area of refuge for us to get to, we're removing that protection. All for the reliance on sprinklers. Because in their report, they took off, well, if you take the human factor out of all these sprinkler uh, statistics, sprinklers operate 99.1% of the time. Problem is, we can't take the human factor out. We deal with humans every single day. And we can't rely 99.1% of the time on those sprinklers. So we're trying hard to refute what this committee is trying to, to accomplish. Roof gardens, I talked about that uh, for, for time, the PV systems, you know, we, there's not a disconnect, but there, we, we've got in the code now, the PVs were not regulated by the codes until this past cycle. Now they are where the disconnect is between the inverter and the array within three feet of the array, but remember, that array is still generating energy. So uh, future concerns, floor construction and floor performance versus protection, polyurethane foam furniture. You saw with Steve's presentation, what a fuel load that is. And applied foam insulation. Here is a typical family home that I stole from Steve's presentation. He stole it from uh, 19, I think 97 episode or edition of National Geographic. What's missing in there? Even with that huge fuel load, we're missing that plasma screen TV. We're missing the two computers. Imagine that to the fuel load. That is gasoline based. That's the fuel load we're facing nowadays. Lightweight construction is even becoming more prevalent. And so we took the furnace test and Steve, along with Dan Majorkowski from this, set up full scale testing. These are only my observations. These are not official numbers yet, but this was a full scale testing done outside of Philadelphia. And we put the eye joist to 100% loading in this full scale test, two minutes and two seconds at post flashover. So after the effects of fire got to the floor systems, two minutes and 20 seconds. For two by 10 dimensional lumber, seven minutes and four seconds. Not much time, is it? Now, I talked about that fire retardant that's painted onto this wood. That gave a performance of eight minutes and 40 seconds. When an indomescent product that does not promote itself to wood application, it's a steel applied indomescent coating it's not, it's not commercially available for wood application. They don't promote it for it. They don't make any claims on it. They provided the materials just for comparison's sake. 17 minutes and 50 seconds. So we're starting to get there. I believe in the capitalist system that if we put the requirement to protect lightweight construction out there, the marketplace will find options besides that chipboard because there's money in it. They'll find those options and they'll make it cost effective. But then we said, okay, how does it compare to days of yesterday? So we found a vacant house in Cleveland, which we have a few of them. So if anybody's in the market for vacant homes, let me know. 
And it was being demolished. We took the floor system out of a 1940 house and we put it to the floor furnace test. Now this was two by eights because that's what they were using back in 1940 to carry the loads, not the two by tens. And we had an 18 minute and five second performance. So we did see a dramatic change in the performance. So is there something to old growth versus new growth? Well, it's really hard to see this picture, but you can see the growth rings between the shades of wood. Now, there are a lot of variables that go into this. Access to sun, access to water, where this tree was grown, species. But right there, to me, paints a thousand, a word, picture paints a thousand words. Because you can see those, that growth ring pattern, how wide it is on the top, and how dense and condensed it is on the bottom. This is gonna require further research, but just think about it. When you go to renovate a home built in the 1920s, you snap the top of that screw off. It's hard to put a nail through it. Today, when you go to work on your house, you have to torque that screw gun down so you don't drive the, the drill right through it or the screw right through it. So there's something to that. And UL and NIST are looking further into it. What's this material? Looks like a steel I-beam, does it not? This is plastic. It's a plastic I-beam, and it, just on the bottom it says, provides years of low maintenance service in areas where steel, aluminum, wood components were traditionally specified. Maximum working temperature, 150 degrees. Even if you protect it with chipboard, that interstitial space is gonna be three to 400 degrees when exposed to fire. And, but it performs to the E84 test. Is that the test we're looking for? No, it's a flame spread test. It doesn't tell us how it's gonna perform in a collapse or load carrying capability. And I'll leave you with this. This is the foam, a spray applied foam, or I should say the exterior foam that's applied under vinyl siding. This is real time. Vinyl siding industry says, hey, we don't have a problem because the code says this has to be protected by an ignition barrier. Look how quickly that, look at the fuel load there, the intensity, the energy that's being created. That's on the, the exterior of our homes. And the ignition barrier is the vinyl siding. And we're losing lots and lots of multifamily homes because there's an exterior fire that goes right up the side of this foam padding into the eave of the attic and right across the attic where there are no sprinklers. Now imagine 10 inches of this on the exterior of a building. And you have that ignition barrier, whether it's sprayed upon or it's applied, a lot of that foam is gonna be glued on. So the glue is gonna to add to the fuel load. So this is the package that we're starting to see in the buildings that are out there. And this is why we're involved in the codes, to try to protect our members and get a say in what our workplace is, what our work environment is. Again, I appreciate you staying a couple extra minutes. We've thrown a lot at you. There's so much more to go over. Uh, feel free to walk up and talk to any of us. Enjoy the day. 